I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, cognitive disabilities and some other types of disabilities and some voter materials and hopefully share some resources with you that perhaps you're familiar with and maybe some that maybe you aren't so familiar with. I'm going to start with the definition of a cognitive disability and <clears throat> excuse me it's the, the definition of cognitive disability is relatively broad and it's not always well defined but sort of in loose terms a cognitive disability is um, a disability where a person has greater difficulty with one or more mental tasks than the average person. So it's a disability that impacts an individual's ability to access, process, and remember information. Oh, and by the way, that handout that you have in front of you with copies of the slides, <clears throat> you will notice as I go through here that there are some slides in there that I won't address that I'll just sort of skip over. So I'm letting you know that so that you don't raise your hand and say you forgot slides 16 and 17. <laughs> there are some extra ones in there. I included some additional ones about a website uh, just for your information, but I'm not going to spend the time to go through them in great detail. <clears throat> so a person with a cognitive disability has difficulty with memory, which is the, the ability of a, of a user to recall what they've learned over time. They have difficulty problem solving. They can be easily frustrated. Attention is an issue. Reading, linguistic, verbal comprehension, math comprehension, and visual comprehension. And I'll talk about a little some of these in a little more detail as we go through this material. <clears throat> we have learning disabilities, which are a lifelong disorder that um, it, it really interferes with a person's ability to receive, to express, or process information. And you know, most people with learning disabilities have above average intelligence. And you may not even be aware that a person has a learning disability because he or she functions so well. So this is one of those issues that we're dealing with that you can't always recognize whether or not a person has a particular kind of cognitive or learning disability. If someone would volunteer, again, to go to the microphone and just read the couple sentences that are on the screen, if you would do that out loud. Fours omep epol reading text can beck uitia challenge. Bikar efol nato maketh ings even hard derby relying on non lit Aral, Kamun, Acacian, and Uns, Tated, Asump, Shuns. So as you can see, David has a bit of a problem with understanding text. I appreciate your wins on that. Yeah. And there's actually about 15 to 20 percent of the population that has some sort of language or text comprehensive difficulty. Um, so we need to keep that in mind if a person has uh, dyslexia or difficulty with reading, one of the easiest things we can do is to give the person a little more time to decipher what it is that they're reading. So something as simple as allowing a little bit more time. There were a lot of famous people that had some sort of uh, reading or comprehensive disability. People like Winston Churchill, Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Albert Einstein, some names you may recognize. James Wa George Washington, John Kennedy, Leonardo da Vinci, to name a few. Here's another example of a reading issue. And one way that we can assist a person that has a comprehension issue is to do something like add a graphic. So if you look at this phrase, you might not recognize it. But if we add a graphic to it, something, something that we call an accessibility fix, then by looking at the graphic, it helps to support and understand what the text is saying. Sometimes that can be helpful. Non-literal text, uh, be careful with things like sarcasm, metaphors, uh, parodies, colloquialisms. These kinds of things 
are not easily understood by an individual with a cognitive disability, may not be easily understood by a person with cognitive disabilities. So most individuals with a cognitive disability look at things literally. So if a person were to say something like, I just love getting stuck in traffic when I'm on my way to work. Well, they probably don't really mean that they like getting stuck in traffic. But if you use a non-literal phrase like that with a person with a cognitive disability, they may be confused because why would you be happy about that? Most people wouldn't be. So be careful with non-literal text when you're dealing with a person that has a cognitive disability. Some individuals have difficulty with visual comprehension. They may look at a photograph on a web page. They may look at a photograph on some kind of diagram and they may recognize it as a photograph, but they might not comprehend what it is the photograph is trying to tell them. So for that, for that situation, something like a video or a person explaining to them might be something that would be more helpful for that individual. Developmental disabilities, uh, some pretty standard, straightforward tips for dealing with people with developmental disabilities. Obviously, speak to the person in clear sentences. You know, try to avoid the non-literal text as much as you can. And sort of gauge the pace of your conversation. I think, you know, I, I shouldn't take for granted that to tell you not to talk down to people. Some people, uh, I think, still have an issue when they're dealing with a person that doesn't seem to understand what it is they're trying to tell them. They may be a little condescending, a little patronizing, but don't talk down to a person. Try to gauge the pace of your conversation, sort of match the expectations of the person that you're communicating with. And the person who has a cognitive or a de developmental disability may be very anxious to please. They may tell you what they think you want to hear. So again, a great deal of patience can be helpful in this situation. And it may be very difficult for a person with a developmental disability to make a quick decision. So allowing them a little bit of time can be helpful. These are some examples of words that may not be understood or may be found confusing uh, by a person with a disability. And these are words we use all the time depending on our jurisdictions. So just be careful with using jargon and the words that may be familiar to us but not necessarily familiar to someone who doesn't use them every day. Words like MVA, Motor Vehicle Administration, primary election, change parties, affiliate with a party, unaffiliated, remedial, etc. This is a free download which is available from the United Spinal Association. I have a copy with me here today. It's just a small booklet I found it very helpful. It has a lot of very useful information on tips for interacting with people with disabilities. It has in it dealing with individuals that are in wheelchairs or have mobility issues, blind or visually impaired, speech disabilities, people of short statute, Tourette syndrome, hidden disabilities, and there's a whole list of other types of disabilities that very simple, easy to use tips that can assist you in those types of situations. It's free. You can download it from that website address on the top of the screen. And again, we're always looking for resources that number one, are free, and number two, are easy, practical for use in your day-to-day -day operations. Talk, I want to talk a little bit about making voting accessible and and talk about the literacy issues that we have in this country. 23% um, of adults in the United States have low literacy competency skills. And roughly, based on the 2012 population, that's about 72 million people. That's a pretty significant number of people. 43% of adults in the United States read at what grade level, do you think? 43% of adults in the U.S. read at what grade level would you guess? Eight. Seven. Eight. Eight grade level is correct. Two out of every five older users reads at the what grade level do you think this would be? 
two out of every five older users reads at what grade level? Did you say 11th? Anybody else? Fifth grade level. Fifth grade level. Most websites, most websites are written at what level would you guess? Since we are all on websites almost daily, what level would you guess? Reading level, what grade level? Yeah. Websites. Tenth grade level. So you can see right there it presents a little bit of a disconnect for a very large percentage of adults in the United States because the level of grade level understanding and the level of information being available, there's a, quite a big gap there. Uh, experts say that content really should be written at about the third grade level to be understandable to 90% of the U.S. population. Staggering figure. Third grade level. Readers with low literacy skills, again, they interpret words and visuals literally. They read very slowly so they get tired and frustrated and they lose meaning. They skip over the hard words. I do that myself, so I'm placing myself in this category. They miss the context, they jump right in, they may have difficulty seeing principal features, and they tire quickly and may give up easily. It's too frustrating. These are some examples of some, what we call whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole word errors where a person looks at a word and a low literacy reader sees the word differently from what the meaning is because they're not pronouncing it, they're actually trying to figure, out, figure it out as a whole word. So the word exit, they see as next. The word include, they see as locating. Agree, they see as argue. Roam, they see as more. So these are some examples of, and you can see the, the difference between the meaning of the word and what they're seeing can be quite substantial. It's called a whole word error, error. Readers with higher literacy skills reading on the web, we prefer information that looks easy to read through. We want things quickly. We don't want to read a lot. We want to skim and get the main idea. We, want to, we don't want to be overloaded with information and we don't want to take time to read the lengthy text and we appreciate having unfamiliar terms and concepts put into plain language. So the difference is between the needs of the higher literacy readers and the low literacy readers isn't really that far apart as far as what our expectations are. And this is basically from information that we're getting from the website. There's a person by the name of Ginny Reddish she founded an institute in Washington, D.C. several years ago, and she dealt with plain and simple language issues in this institute, and she teamed up with a name that perhaps some of you will recognize, Dana Chisnell. Dana's been working for many years in plain and simple language issues, particularly in voter materials for uh, local election officials, and she has created these little, these little booklets, and they're called, they're called field guides, and right now there's eight of them in print. And she wrote these in plain and simple language, and there are, uh, they're available at this website if you want to download them for free. They cover topics like designing usable ballots, writing instructions that voters understand, choosing how to communicate with voters, designing election department websites, guiding voters through the polling place, and several others. So these field guides are, again, very simple to use. They have big print. There's not a lot of pages. Very practical, useful quick information on several different topics that perhaps you will find helpful and useful. Field guides. If you want to order the real deal, you can get these shipped to you for a very nominal fee. I think the eight of them is like $6 for a local election official. 
If you're not a local election official, it jumps up in price a little bit. But I think it's currently about $6 to get the group of eight of them, so not a bad deal, and you might find some of them useful. Those are the field guides. And then Ginny, this Ginny Reddish wrote a book. It's called Letting Go of the Words. She designed this book to assist people in designing their websites. And the way that she views the website is that when a person first contacts your website, website, they're starting a conversation with your website. And that's how she designed this book to assist people to design websites like a conversation between the person that's supplying the information and the person that's accessing the information. Here's some list of ambiguous words. Uh, these cause issues for individuals with low literacy uh, skills and because they have multiple meanings. This is a partial list. I took this from a list of 1,026 ambiguous words. We have a lot of ambiguous words in, the, in, the, in, the, in our language, in English, and they can cause confusion uh, because of the fact that they have the multiple uh, meanings. So be careful of uh, using ambiguous words in print material. I'm going to show you a couple examples of some things that were actually changed on some ballots where the language was tweaked that added to the success of the voter in understanding what it was that they were trying to do with the ballot. And that basically means reducing the amount of text on key screens. So here's one example, and I know this is difficult to read from the back, so I will tell you what this says. The top button says, touch to see additional candidates. Several people struggle with that see additional candidates uh, issue. They changed it to make it more simplified. The text was changed to touch to see more names. So the jargon was eliminated, the text was simplified, and that assisted in making it easier for a person to navigate through this particular part of the ballot. Here's another example, and again, I don't expect you to read that on the uh, top there. It says that you could have voted for four candidates and you only voted for two. You could have voted for four candidates and you only voted for two. That was changed to you voted for two people, you can vote for two more. So what they did was they reduced the election jargon, they focused on actions, and they move from the familiar to the new. The familiar was, you voted for two. The new is, you can vote for two more. So they simplified it. And here's one more. People were confused and sometimes anxious about this page. They backed away from casting their vote. It says, are you sure you have finished voting? Once you press the vote button, you will not be able to make any more changes. Sounds rather threatening, you know? What's going to happen if I don't press that vote button? If you want to make changes, touch to return to the, ballot, to the ballot button. If you're ready to cast your vote, touch the vote button. That was changed to, are you finished? If you want to make changes, touch the return to ballot button, and the remaining sentence was kept the same. Focusing the text on the message and the choice rather than on the danger of making a mistake made it clearer for voters and allowed them for, allowed for easier processing and more confidence in voting. So those are just a couple examples of really just changing some language, very simple changes to language if you're allowed to do that can make a huge difference in, in a person understanding the process. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the uh, the RAV website, when the RAV team got together, one of the organizations that um, was involved as a team member was the Center for Accessible Information. And they were charged with putting together an actual website showing all of the information that the RAV group came up with during the course of the three years. All of this information can be found on that website, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. 
But I want to tell you just uh, briefly that when we talk about accessible voting, it's not just the physical access. It's not just a person being able to access the voting or the polling place. It also means the opportunity to integrate with the voters assistive technology. And it also means that information is available in language and format that meets the needs of all. I think traditionally we thought about accessibility sort of lean toward the physical access to the building, but it means more than that. And we need to, we need to be cognizant of that fact. I want to show you a, a short video. Uh, this is uh, Nancy Ward. Nancy had the opportunity to vote on a voting system uh, for the first time. She voted independently. She was at a SABE election, SABE, S-A-B-E. It stands for Self-Advocacy Becoming Empowered. And at that uh, election, at the SABE election, they use what's called a Prime 3 voting system. This afternoon, we're going to have a representative from Clemson University who's going to tell you a lot more about this Prime 3 system. And, but in the meantime, I want to show you the reaction of this person uh, to vote, being able to vote on a voting system for the first time privately and independently. The thing that I thought was really exciting about being able to vote the way we voted at the SABE election today is that we had pictures and it was they were able to make it bigger so I could see it and we were asked first you know to test it a lot of times people with disabilities they have things tested for them, and then they're asked to test it after it's already made. But in this case, you guys gave us the opportunity to do it ourselves. And that was very cool. That was really cool. Do you think it's really accessible? The yes. Prime yes. Um, and one of the things that was cool about it is that. Um, when I said I couldn't, it kept repeating itself because I was pressing too hard. We came, we came up with a way to um, um, to just to have me tap, and that seemed to work, and so I could do it all the way through then, and that was very cool too to be able to do it independently. Dude, so the, today was, before today in other elections, you weren't able to vote by yourself. Tell me how you feel about being able to vote alone. Um, it makes me very excited. Um, to be able to do it by myself and not to have <clears throat> somebody to have to explain it to me. So it was very important and very empowering. And I do have the disability power now for devoting and I'm very excited about that. This is the home page of the uh, Center for Accessible Information, the RAV partner that held, had the responsibility of putting together the RAV website. <clears throat> they are very helpful in assisting organizations in making not only websites accessible, but also printed material and accessible as well. And they have a lot of very valuable information, so accessibleinfo.org. If you have the opportunity to go and visit and take a look at some of uh, the things that they work with, you might uh, find something that could be very useful for you. And I like the graphic that they have on their homepage. You probably can't read this from the back, 
but it's a fire hydrant, and it indicates getting information off the internet, internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. I think that's a pretty, pretty powerful graphic. This is the home page of the RAV website, Research Alliance for Accessible Voting website. And as you can see, they've got the video of Nancy right on, their, uh, right on the home page there. It's got a lot of valuable information for election officials. If you click on the library, it's got a whole section designated to election official resources. And it's got things, training guides and checklists and all kinds of very valuable information which is all free. And again, I think you'll find if you take a few moments to go through it, you may find something that could be useful for you uh, in your training issues and other issues perhaps in your office. So that's the RAV website. And I am out of time. We have one more session that will be in Minneapolis on April 10th, pass the word.